Hi, this is Eva for Once Upon a Timeline, and today we're going to talk about creatures that are being turned into zombies. So you may have heard about this first one. It's the ant that gets infected by a fungus. The fungus takes over the brain of the ant, causing the ant to climb to a location a little higher above trails of ants, and then he, it causes the ant to somehow clamp down on a twig or branch or leaf, and then the ant dies there, and then the fungus sprouts a giant fruiting body out of the back of the ant, and the spores rain down onto passing ants below, and the cycle repeats. Now, the first time I heard about this was maybe a few years ago. At that time, there was just one uh, kind of fungus that does this. Now there are hundreds, and you will see that the fruiting bodies are getting longer and longer and weirder and weirder. That's the fruiting body here. It's basically the, uh, the thing that makes the spores that uh, go down onto the lower ants. Okay, so it turns out the U.S. has one of these uh, zombifying funguses, and that's this one right here. Um, they're everywhere now. So you may also notice that uh, the variety of the fruiting bodies has uh, significantly expanded. And now on some of the ants, there are two of these spore packs that come out. This one's really long here. Uh, there's all different looks now to it. Uh, some of them are just extra weird. Like these, this one here looks like two weird antennae. So yeah, it's, uh, it's really expanded this whole zombie ant thing. Um, there are so many different ants that are infected with it now, supposedly. Uh, look at that one. Just so weird. Okay, so that's the ants. But this uh, whole concept of the zombification of other creatures has really expanded since the ants. I mean, there are so many of them. This is a rather recent one. This is actually a snail that has been taken over by the larva of this creature here. And the larva, there are parasitic worms, but this is in their larva form, cause the, um, it causes the creature, the snail, to... Um, climb up to a higher area and broad daylight. Now, normally these snails are nocturnal and they hide, but this kind of brainwashes them into climbing up to this area where birds can find them. Now, strangely, these larvae need to go into bird stomachs as part of their life cycle. So supposedly they're imitating um, caterpillars here because normally birds don't like to eat snails. And so they imitate these caterpillars and uh, the birds are supposed to bite the eye stalks off of these snails, and then the, the uh, larvae are in where they want to be. So this is pretty weird. So they're making this, this uh, fluctuation here. Supposedly, they only do this during the day. Even though worms have no brain, somehow they know to only fluctuate during the day. And supposedly, the snail can actually live through this, and regenerate its eye stalks, which is also really interesting. So yeah, this is a very new one here. A lot of these new parasites are having very complicated uh, life cycles, going through multiple hosts. They're going through hosts that uh, you would not expect to um, have these creatures. For instance, that last one, it's going, the, somehow the parasite needs to get into birds but it goes through snails, but then birds don't eat snails. So how did that even come to pass? It's just weird. I mean, I, it's Darwin's going to have a hard time explaining a lot of this stuff because uh, how does this, this creature then need to get into an animal that, um, that would not have normally eaten it? How would it develop that? Okay, so here's another one. The lancet fluke or flat room, worm. The, the, the parasite lives in three hosts. First, snail eats cow dung that has the eggs. The ha eggs hatch in the snail, and the snail then uh, entraps the larvae and, and pushes them out. Then an ant comes along and eats the slime. The s then the parasites get into the ant. And here's where it's weird. One of them sets up 
some of the parasites set up around the nerves that control the ant's mandibles and other parasites set up around the head. The parasite needs to spend its time in the in liver of a cow. So cows don't eat ants. Again, this is weird. So the, somehow the ant has to get into the cow. So what it does is with the two different parasites controlling two regions of the ant is the ant climbs up to a top of a juicy piece of grass and clamps down and waits there and then hopes that a cow will come and eat the grass and accidentally eat the ant and then the then the cow's liver gets infected with these worms and then the cycle repeats so again that's just weird you know cows don't eat ants so how could these larvae um, get form a cycle where they force the ant to eat the cow it's just it's it's just too hard to comprehend how such a thing would naturally be created. Okay, so here's another one. The larva that parasitic worms Glypta pantellas uh, may be feeding on the caterpillars. The wasp deposits 80 eggs in the caterpillars. When the eggs hatch, some of the, the eggs... Um, eventually well they all turn into larvae and then some of them squeeze out of the caterpillar and spin a cocoon but the other larvae stay in the caterpillar and control the caterpillar to make it defend the cocoons so the caterpillar stays there and and fights off any and all attackers that it can and protects the cocoon so i no word what happens to the larvae that stay behind but it sounds like those larvae are basically sacrificing themselves for the other larvae that escape so it's pretty weird because then the caterpillar dies off of this so all those left leftover larvae would then die so it's really kind of a complicated um system even within just these larvae very weird all right so the next one I, I showed some video of this one in a recent live stream, but I wasn't sure what it was. But I realize now that this is a more of a zombie attack thing. So this is a cricket. It gets infected with these worms that grow inside the cricket. Now, these worms do two things. One, it causes the cricket to stop chirping so that it will survive longer. It, chirping crickets are more likely to get eaten, so it, it silences the cricket. And then when they're ready to hatch out, these worms cause the cricket to uh, go out and look for water and jump in. Now, normally crickets will not go into water because they're bad swimmers. So these crickets jump in and usually the crickets will die and then all these worms will come out and that's part of their life cycle is that they infect things in the water. So, I mean, these, these things are called horsehair worms and they can reach up to a foot now, I've seen some locations saying that there is a six-foot-long variety of horsehair worm, but I was not able to find uh, any more info on that, so that one, I think, is still incubating. Okay, so now here's another one. You might have seen this one. This one's a little bit older ME. Basically, this little creature here hatches inside a fish's gills and climbs up to its tongue, and then it slurps the fluids out of the tongue until the tongue dies. And then it takes the place of the tongue and sits there and, and chomps on food that comes in that the fish eats. And it just stays there for a really long time. So these fish can survive with this thing in their mouth. Now there's um, some new storyline to this that I did not see at first. The storyline now is that these creatures are born without a gender, without a sex. And then as they develop in the gills, one of them turns female and goes into the mouth region. And the rest stay male, mate with her when she's in the mouth region, and then leave. So that's kind of a weird thing because you have the, the different um, offspring all mating with each other in this storyline. So then after the mating, all the little uh, eggs are spread out from the mouth of the fish. Uh, this one I, I assume shows a male and a female here. Uh, it doesn't really explain. It says a pair of tongue lice attach the inside of fish. So I'm not sure if we're going to get more than one. Uh, I have not found any storyline yet on that or if that's just going to be a male. So that one's pretty weird. You can see some uh, images of this tongue louse here. Um, there's This one shows how it's inside the mouth here. 
There's another one. So they're saying uh, a number of fish can be infected by these uh, tongue louse. I guess that's a small one there. Anyway, yes, definitely gross. All right, so here's another one. Uh, this stuff, this bacteria, this pathogenic fungus called Batrychotritium dendrobatidis. I probably killed that name pretty bad, but it's BD for short. Uh, BD has been blamed for the extinction of hundreds of amphibian species and poses a threat to up to one-third of the world's frogs, salamanders, and other amphibians. So I've never even heard of this, but apparently it's slaughtering millions. Uh, strangely, not any word on it, though, until just now. But um, So this BD, it kills some species, but other species are able to survive but weirdly, the males become more sexually active. They're lethargic all the time except for when they're looking for a mate. And then that behavior doubles. And uh, by mating with the females, he spreads the fungus. So there's a theory that uh, this BD is somehow controlling these frogs to mate more so it can spread more. So it's basically an STD for frogs. Okay, so the last one... These zombie barnacles. These zombie barnacles infect crabs. Um, they get onto the back of the crab and they cause all the male crabs to act like female crabs. And then they lay their eggs in the, in the region of the crab where the crab would normally have its own eggs. But now it has these, uh, these parasitic eggs. And weirdly, uh, since all the males act like females and the females still act like females, these crabs protect these eggs and they, um, and they nurture them until the eggs hatch. When, the, when it's ready to produce, the parasite creates an egg sac that develops in the same area that a female's crab's egg normally would go. This parasite doesn't dis discriminate based on gender. It, gender. it quickly makes both genders new, neutral. So the parasite is really controlling their body. Their bodies are taken over, and they're just being used as factories. Okay, so there's one thing that a lot of these stories have in common. It's just zombification of other creatures. We have insects. We have frogs. We have crabs. Um, there's also a lot of weird sexual things where they some of them change the gender or the um, behaviors. So there's a lot of gender swapping. Uh, that just seems to be a theme with the ME and on a lot of the animals. Uh, but it goes beyond just these lower animals. It goes beyond just frogs and crabs and insects. There are actually quite a few weird stories coming out with mammals and even humans having a zombie issues. So in our next segment, part two, I will be discussing the human factor. This is Eva signing off for Once Upon a Timeline.